The stage adaptation of Mark Haddon's best-selling novel, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, opened here on the smallest stage of the National Theatre on London's South Bank in 2012. It went on to win seven Olivier Awards, transferred to the West End, and then went on tour in Britain. And the Broadway production has recently taken New York by storm. The story in both the book and the play is told by a 15-year-old boy who finds other people frightening and confusing. And it has helped transform our understanding of a neurological condition that affects one in a hundred children. That boy is called Christopher. And tonight on Imagine, we bring you his very own documentary with a little help from his friends. Somebody that he's trusted all his life has suddenly become untrustworthy. Now, somebody who's not autistic would think, well, just because you killed a dog doesn't mean you're going to kill a human being. You killed a dog out of anger. But to a neurotypical person, a dog is probably less significant to another human being. But somebody on the autistic spectrum wouldn't make that interpretation. It would be just like, well, you killed a dog so you could kill a person. Great. I found out I was on the spectrum when I was 12, and the reason I was told was because I started asking my mum questions about why I was different. In what way did you find yourself being different? Well, I got bullied, but also I liked computers, and I think that I struggled socially, and I never realised when I was at school that, and I think, you know, Christopher, if he was a real-life person, he'd probably learn this when he left school, that there are many people who like many different things that aren't necessarily mainstream, um, but I didn't know that when I was at school and I just thought I was always going to be lonely. It was seven minutes after midnight. The dog was lying on the grass in the middle of the lawn in front of Mrs. Shear's house. Its eyes were closed. It looked as if it was running on its side, the way dogs run when they think they are chasing a cat in a dream. But the dog was not running or asleep. The dog was dead. What the fuck have you done to my dog? There was a garden fork sticking out of the dog. The dog was called Wellington. So I began with this picture of a dog with a fork through it. No real idea of where that came from, except that I have quite a black sense of humour. And I thought there's something absolutely hilarious about it. I mean, it's never funny, never funny on stage. But in my mind, I thought there was something really blackly funny about that. But to make it funny, you had to tell the story in a certain way. And that was the genesis of Christopher. My name is Christopher John Francis Boone. I live at 36 Randolph Street, Swindon, Wiltshire. I know all the countries of the world and the capital cities, and every prime number up to 7,507. So then we've got, we've got masses of these. So these are the Christopher's book. Oh, right. And we have masses of them because they get really trashed. So this is the beginning of the story. We're meant to be writing stories today. So why don't you write about what happened to Wellington last night? OK, I will. I can help you. Will you help me with the spelling and the grammar and the footnotes? 
So this is the book that Siobhan starts reading at the top of the show. I find people confusing. This is for two main reasons. The first main reason is that people do a lot of talking without using any words. What was central to me in the adaptation was the notion of making Siobhan his teacher, uh, the narrator of the piece. In the book, she's quite an ephemeral figure, or she's quite a marginal character in the book. She's the heart of the play. It struck me that I think everybody has a favourite teacher. English, no, we don't want to go to that one. We don't want to go there. We can go to maths and we can go to science. She reads Christopher's book with exactly the same perspective as we read it. She's uh, astonished by his imagination. She cares for him. She understands things that he doesn't understand himself. The whole play is based around her effectively falling in love with Christopher and falling in love with his ambition to solve the mystery of who killed Wellington, to solve the case of the curious incident of the dog in the night time. I've decided I'm going to try and find out who killed Wellington because a good day is a day for projects and for planning things. Who's Wellington? Wellington is a dog that used to belong to my neighbour, Mrs Shears, but he is dead now because somebody killed him by putting a garden fork through him. And I found him, then a policeman came and thought I'd killed him, but I hadn't. Then he tried to touch me, so I hit him, then I had to go to the police station. Gosh. I'm going to find out who really killed Wellington and make it a project. In school, we have 36 children. Our smallest class is three, and our largest class is six. Well, actually, we've had a new body, so it's seven, but we try and keep about six. Uh, so they're very small, um, but our kids are very complex you. young people. No, I think it's... Kids uh, get I like it when Adam and Martin come here. Do you? Yeah. What are you doing at the moment, Reuben? No? I just like to feel that. Yeah, but you can't. Why? Ask. Can I feel that? Yes. Oh, it, feel, it feels like cat fur a bit, doesn't it, Adam? It feels cat. like. What do you no, think I mean... it is? You could ask, you? What does it be? What is that fur? No, what is no. that? I think it's fake fur. Oh, but does it look like cat fur? Ask what, do you know what it is? Do you, uh, fake fur, you said. Ruben, do you know what that is? What's it for? What's that for? It's a microphone. Really? Mm. Hello, 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 hello. Simon felt, when he was reading the book, he felt what was exciting about it was that as you were reading this book, you suddenly realised that Christopher had been told to write a book and that this was the book that he had written. So you were reading his words. And so that's what he wanted to do with the stage adaptation, that then it was a play. And, oh, we're, we're watching the play that he'd written from the book that he'd written. Christopher, I want to ask you something. I was wondering if you'd like to make a play out of your book. I think a lot of people would be really interested in what would happen if people took your book and started acting bits out of it. No, I don't like acting because it's pretending that something is real and it's not really real at all, so it's like a kind of lie. But people like stories, Christopher. Some people find things which are kind of true in things which are made up. You like your Sherlock Holmes stories, and you know Sherlock Holmes isn't a real person, don't you? I noticed a dog in the yard. Does he sleep out there at night? Yes, always. He's a very good watchdog. You didn't by any chance hear him barking during the night? No, I didn't. No. I was given the collection of Sherlock Holmes books and collection of Sherlock Holmes short stories. The red one? And no, it, the red there was, it was in two separate volumes, short stories. Uh, and I got the hmm. really huge one. That I need a special bag. I, know, I, I need a special bag to carry it around. What do you like about Sherlock Holmes? He's a detective. He actually works very much up like how I work. I don't... I don't leap to conclusions if they don't have enough evidence. 
Because like if I saw my shoe, I wouldn't necessarily wouldn't I wouldn't automatically jump to the conclusion that it was mine. Mm. Because someone else could have lost exactly the same shoe. And also because loads of um like television versions of Sherlock seem very autistic. Do you think yeah. in the books that he seems a bit autistic? Yeah. Although they, they annoyingly they, they hadn't actually discovered autism by that point. So it's impossible it's impossible to actually tell if he would have been diagnosed as autistic. Is there any other point to which you want to draw my attention? Well, uh, to the uh, curious incident of the dog in the night time. The dog was perfectly quiet in the night? No, that was the curious incident. Oh. In the book, he describes himself as being a little bit like Sherlock Holmes, in that he can detach his mind at will, and his brain was a bit like a laboratory. So that was very much how we decided to design the show, like a laboratory of his brain. The first half of the show is like a kind of whodunit. So we also wanted to make the, the design a bit like a incident board in a crime room in a police station. Can I help you? Do you know who killed Wellington? Who the fuck is Wellington? Mrs. Shear's dog. Someone killed her dog with a fork. Right, I'm going to make this one like a, a whole block colour. Well, maybe Christopher wants to be a detective to try and make the world make sense to him or to try and understand it or try and solve the, the problems around him. <laughs> But you'd probably like me to paint something specific, wouldn't you? Like something a bit more like um, kind of figurative. Not necessarily. Because these paintings aren't about anything in particular. I'm kind of like, it's, it's, it is a little bit weird painting when you know that you've got uh, you and Martin standing in the corner. That, that is a little bit weird. Christopher is making logical assumptions about the world around him. And the world is illogical. The world doesn't make sense. Mm. Uh, and that's a big problem for people on the spectrum, understanding that the world doesn't make sense. In some ways, his world is quite straightforward and quite, yes, literal, um, but you know, in, in other in other sort of areas of his mind, he's he's an incredibly gifted thinker. Animals, maths, space, computers, there's a purity to them, which is the way that Christopher sees the world, really, and would like the world to be. I think it's the complexities of other people and human behaviour which Christopher finds really a struggle to deal with. When I first wrote the script, what I was trying to do was get as deeply as possible into Christopher's mind. And that actually was always one of the challenges of the whole production, is taking the audience inside Christopher's brain. I think it was key to Bunny's work designing it and really the essence of Marianne's production. I suppose for me the play is about isolation and a lot of the prime characters feel isolated. And I think that Probably Mark and Simon and I have a strong connection to what that felt like as we were growing up in different ways for all of us. I like looking at the rain. I like it because it makes me think how all the water in the world is connected. Does it? This water, this rain, has evaporated, actually, from somewhere like maybe the Gulf of Mexico, maybe, or Baffin Bay, and now it is falling in front of the house, and then it will drain into the gutter, and then it will flow to a sewage station where it will be cleaned, and then it will go into a river, and then it will go back into the ocean again. He sees things that the rest of us do not see. He sees beauty, he experiences wonder in a way that no one sitting in the audience does about certain things. As a result of that 
outsider point of view. He looks back at us. And one of the experiences of reading the book, and hopefully one of the experiences of watching the play, you start to realize how odd we are and how odd our way of life is. And you only have to take a few steps outside the boundary of normality to think, we are very odd indeed, all of us. Hello. Are you filming us, sir? Why? I don't always do what I'm told. Why? Because when people tell you what to do, it is usually confusing and does not make sense. For example, people often say, be quiet. But they don't tell you how long to be quiet for. Marianne tasked me with becoming a sort of mini-expert in autism or Asperger's. So I bought textbooks, I read blogs, I went... I sort of found out as much information as I could. I contacted schools and uh, Marianne was really keen that we went to meet some teachers and to meet some pupils and families who have experience of autism or Asperger's syndrome. Hello. Is this your room? Well, this is my room. Um, this is a map of um, London. Um, I've recently become very interested in London boroughs, and it may seem quite stereotypically autistic to a lot of people, but it's very fascinating knowing which, what, which district is in which borough. What's that list? Oh, stuff that I need to remember to pack um, when I went um, up to Liverpool. Um, toothbrush and toothpaste and CD because it was my backing track for a poem that I, I performed then. I would also like to... Why, why did you need a list? Be, to help me remember? Why oh. else? Mm. <laughs> Do you make lots of lists? Um... Yeah, quite a lot. Well, actually, it's my mum that makes them, if I'm honest. I went to a lot of different schools for autistic people, and one of the things which always stayed with me, which I think one of the teachers told me, which was that it's like the, the water in the bath is always kind of spilling. It's always about to spill in sort of someone like Christopher. And so at any moment, he's trying desperately to hold on to the bath water, and, it, and it's, it's always about to spill out because it's, the world is so random to him and everything that's not planned and everything that's not expected for him is scary. Thank you. Okay, there you go. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> but when we first did the workshop in here, yeah. that was four years ago. This is in this room, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Chris was being picked up in the car. Yeah. No, it looked much better when um, when I saw it in the play. <laughs> and we were, you know, I, I kind of can understand why they why they left the bath bit out. I nicked little things off you. You know this. I've told you this before. Yeah, but borrowed you... would be I would rather put. Yeah. You would. Borrowed. For borrowed. Me, I would say. Borrowed. Yeah, 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 I didn't steal. They're still yours. <laughs> but I borrowed little some of the little things which I thought. That thing. This. When can you explain that to us? Flick this round. I can, yes. Um, it's uh, basically, I'm in my own world. I'm playing a sort of accounting game in my head. I'm making somebody older or making them younger. Or basically, I'm counting from one extreme to another. Like thinking of th a word that's not offensive and thinking of the worst word or vice versa making it cleaner or dirtier or, you know... Does it make you feel calmer? What's it called? It's called daydreaming, really. It is. It's something mm. that I do when I'm daydreaming. In the play, I think, for me, it became something when I was very anxious and stressed. When I I'm could, anxious and I stressed, I usually use... make noises, I do. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Christopher makes noises, he yeah, groans... Yeah, the and... noises were great. I could totally see myself in you when, um, when you were performing. We had read about it in books, we'd, we'd seen documentaries, but to meet yeah. someone who could really... Well, you're it hearing us. it from the horse's mouth. Exactly. And, and, you know, I'm using a... Using I'm using, metaphor. using a metaphor there, <laughs> yeah, you know. I know. See, you know <laughs> when I was young, if you had said this... If I had heard somebody say that about 20 or 15 years ago, I'd say, a horse's mouth? Horses don't talk. <laughs> what? Nay. What's that mean to people? <laughs>
The second main reason I find people confusing is that people often talk using metaphors. The word metaphor means carrying something from one place to another. And it is when you describe something by using a word for something that it isn't. This means that the word metaphor is a metaphor. When we look at Christopher, we could say he's at the high-functioning end of the autism spectrum, and it is a very broad spectrum. Intellectually, he's very gifted, he's even precocious in some subjects like mathematics. Um, but if you analysed his communication, even then you'd realise that despite the presence of language, he still has communication difficulties. And one example of that is taking language very literally. So assuming that what people say is what they mean. Whereas a typical child, very early on, understands that what people say isn't always true, that they might be joking, they might be using language in a figurative way, idioms or metaphor. Christopher is taking words as literal, and that's very common in people with Asperger's syndrome. They don't see the point of some kind of gap between what you say and what you mean. Mother died two years ago. I came home from school one day and no one answered the door. So I went and found the secret key that we keep under a flower pot outside the kitchen window. It's all a metaphor. I think that the death of Wellington, the dog, and the way that Christopher feels about that and then obsesses about it and decides to become a detective to work out who killed the dog is all a metaphor for how he feels about the loss of his mum. July 2008. I was nine years old. It was a Saturday. We were on holiday in Cornwall, on the beach in a place called Polpero. The next Manhattan bound seven local train will arrive in approximately two minutes. I grew up in England from when I was like seven until I was uh, 18. Went to school there in Devon. But the rest of my life I've been traveling. First seven years of my life where I grew up in a caravan traveling around the United States and Canada and Europe with my family. Um, obviously not on my own, that would be impressive. <laughs> this is my first job. So how does it feel? <laughs> awesome. I'm sorry your mother's died. She's had a heart attack. It wasn't expected. What kind of heart attack? I don't know what kind of heart attack. Now isn't the moment. Christopher to be asking questions. Like it was that. probably an aneurysm. The death of the dog is connected somehow, possibly, well, definitely subconsciously, Christopher's head to the death of his mom. If he discovers who killed Wellington, you will then discover the truth about his mom. It's a um, transference of grief. So his mom has died, he hasn't been able to grieve because he doesn't know how to, he doesn't talk about it. The dog is dead and he starts to really properly investigate and mourn that.
My situation was an absolute nightmare because when he got about two or three, I knew there was something wrong because he couldn't communicate good. Mm. I mean, like, you know, when you, when you go on the street, like we would see neighbors and they would say, well, like, how, how are you today? He would just stand there and look at him, mm. you know, and he didn't, I could, I don't know, I've always been intuitive with my son and I would tell him what to say. And just looking at him, I could tell he just did not know how to have a conversation. So I told his doctor, and the problem I had was he looked normal, so the doctor didn't think anything was wrong. His teachers didn't think anything was wrong. They thought, he'll grow out of it. Once he starts school, he'll be fine. No, that did not happen. I was not able to get a diagnosis until he was 11. Wow. What was his life like in school prior to that diagnosis? It was a nightmare. It was like, an absolute was he like accused nightmare. of poor behavior? Or? Yes. Uh, the teacher locked him out of the classroom. He was bullied, threatened. His life was threatened. And I fought. I had to fight the Board of Ed. And I fought and fought and fought. But and finally, I was able to get him in private school. You know, but it's still a struggle. Every day is a struggle. You yeah. know, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's not. What can I say? It's my son, and I'm <laughs> best I can, you know? Do you remember much about her? I remember the 20th of July, 2008. I was nine years old. It was a Saturday. We were on holiday in Cornwall. We were on a beach in a place called Polpera. The routine of having that mother figure is broken. And Christopher lives in patterns, in a world of patterns, so he, he knows that he comes home at this time and he does this at this time. And once the mother figure has disappeared from his life, his, his routine is shattered. So if he can reconnect to that and form some sort of routine, waking up at this time and going to school and doing these things at this time, then life is perfect, life is fine, because it fits into nice compartmentalised boxes. Action Green. Sunday, you're going to wake up. You're going to do what next? We wee brush your teeth. Get dressed. Have breakfast. What do you want for breakfast? Um, cream toast. For breakfast? And a uh, um, honey toast. Okay. When you are on the autistic spectrum, routines can be very important because if you have difficulties with social imagination, if you find it difficult to know what's going to happen next, then having a routine is really comforting because you don't have to worry about anything unexpected. Let's do three more, Mummy, and then we'll be done. Okay. People on the autistic spectrum often have difficulties with flexibility of thought. It's as if you're a train on a train track and you're going along a single train track and suddenly a huge brick wall has appeared in front of you and you can't go backwards. All you can do is smash into this wall and you can't go any further. Whereas a neurotypical person would see lots of different routes that one could take instead so that you could go round the wall and then you could just carry on. But that's not the way that many autistic people are able to think. How do you like it? Uh, just white, thanks. Okay. Yeah, same, please. Three. Routine. You know, the basics of what's happening when, how, with whom are kind of, you know, they are... It's at the centre of his the everything. Of everything. Mm. It's the fear of the unknown. Yeah. It's, it, it's right. terrifying for him. Yeah. Uh, two and a half. This is two and a half. When I would pick him up from nursery, it was a ten minute drive home. And one day, I, I, I turned left, I just went on a different route instead of turning right. Yeah. And he started screaming. From a quiet car to screaming his little heart out. Mm. And I worked out quite soon after, once I knew about autism, that's what it was. Because you just he deviated, really didn't know deviated, that. He must yeah. have been no, taking a kind no. of photographic image in of the roads mm. and memorising it yeah. to kind of comfort yeah. himself. Yeah. And I didn't go that way. And he, and he just yeah. couldn't handle it. He eventually got diagnosed when he was three and four months or something. Yeah. There was a relief so, that there was like there is a there is a specific 
condition this boy's got and there's a reason for all the behaviours that we couldn't... It wasn't me not weaning him yeah. properly. Why? He was fussy with food. You know, yeah. I had a, there was a lot of guilt yeah. that I... Why is he like... And did the, I not engage with him properly? Did I not do that? You know, constantly going on websites yeah. about what's meant to happen next. Oh, God, I didn't do that. Was it? Is it my fault? What would he like, then? Oh, he'd like to go on a bus to somewhere go on he knows. A bus. So if I say, let's go on a bus, he'll be great. Let's go on the 82 to Victoria. And he'll know every stop from Finchley. It takes three hours. And so what do you mean he knows everything? He knows the name of the yeah, stop and the stop. number? Yeah, the... and the number and the yeah. sounds. And, You'll and... hear him at, bed, at bedtime reciting back. Yeah. The next stop is Victoria Park. Buses and trains are everything because he can control the stimulation of the sounds, the roads. He knows what stops. He loves light. Lampposts is his current passion. Christopher, do you understand that I love you? The thing that obviously that comes out so so strongly for with you two, and I think in the play, is that the, the love is never in question, yeah. but it's how you deal with that. Mm. I mean, presumably, you give love, mm. but you don't, get you don't get it back. No, you don't. Mm. It's, 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 yeah, it's not, it's not love in the way that you've expected it, or, you know, whatever expectations you've got as a parent. Mm. It's certainly not what I expected. Mm. Um, but that tiny, tiny little thing will happen. A, a, a little bit of progress, or a, it's funny that in the play when he puts his hand up, you know, we yeah, we nice. naturally do that with Isaac. Right. It's massive. I asked my parents whether they felt uh, that I didn't love them like other children did, and whether they felt unloved or, you know, if they felt that having an autistic child was bad in some way. And they said that um, they felt that people, when they have kids, that maybe they have different um, expectations, but they just had an expectation that they'd have a live baby and that was all that was important. So whatever I did didn't really matter. Toast. Mm. Orange juice. Right. Daddy. Yeah. I, I love you. I love you too. Nice, I love you. Do you know what? When we saw the chickens, a king, was it a daddy or a mummy? When we saw the. When we were on holiday? When we were on holiday, mummy, when, when these two boys were not here, mummy. Um, well, when we were on holiday, yeah. there was a daddy chicken, and he's called a cockerel, oh. and he had all the red. Do you remember? He had all that red skin. Is he a grown up chicken? He's a grown up chicken. Which station is near the chicken town? You know. You definitely know. Maybe it's true, Ralph. Mm -hmm. Falmer. Yeah. Falmer, that's right. train to Connecticut, Milford, Connecticut, to visit the set where that's being built. They've been painting all the panels, so today I need to check the, some of the paint finish on the panels because last time I was there it was a little bit shiny. And then they're raising them up because they're going to start doing all the wiring into the back of them so that all the LEDs and the pixels and everything get put into all of that, so the whole kit can come into the theatre ready wired and finished, and that's the, <laughs> that's the idea anyway. Do you like computers? Yes, I like computers. I have a computer in my room. And I like maps and uh, looking after Toby, and I like outer space and being on my own. I bet you're very good at maths, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm going to take my A-level maths next month and I'm going to get an A-star. Now look, looks great. It's good. <laughs>
it had to be a piece of imagination. The more realistic you made it, the more domestic and clunky and heavy it felt. And as Christopher says in the play, he doesn't really like acting on plays because it's like a form of lie. So we never wanted to, to make it seem like a form of a lie. It was clearly what it was. The props clearly displayed, the actors clearly displayed, and they're sort of hopefully taking the audience with them on this highly imaginative, suggestive, stylized way of telling Christopher's story. All of these lines have been routed out. So that's done by a computer. So it's really, really crisp and accurate. So it makes it look like uh, graph paper. Mr. Boone, nobody has ever taken an A-level examination in the school before. He can be the first then. I don't know if we have the facilities in the school to allow him to do that. Then get the facilities. Christopher can always do his A-levels later when he's 18, which is, after all, the age everyone else takes their A-levels. Christopher is getting a crap enough deal already, don't you think? Without you shitting on him from a great height as well. Jesus, this is the one thing he's really good at. Christopher does have probably different relationships to your typical 15-year-old. So he has um, a good relationship with his um, rat, Toby. But also he thinks about maths a lot. And in some ways, I just said, he kind of has a relationship with maths. It's what he finds comforting. It's what he turns to um, when he's stressed, I suppose, a bit like a comforting blanket or, you know, perhaps you'd go to your parents more often. 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, We also see in Christopher that he loves patterns, being able to recite prime numbers because the sequence never changes. A prime number will always be a prime number. And there must be something quite reassuring for people with autism, that they want to find their solid anchors in the world. And what seems to be the case is that a lot of that circuitry for making sense of the social world, the, the brain-based circuitry for being able to anticipate another person's reactions, being able to read someone else's emotions, seems to not be functioning in the very intuitive or natural way. So the social world becomes a world of confusion and unpredictability whereas the world of repetition, the world of objects, the world of numbers, becomes the much safer, more predictable world. I think I would make a very good astronaut. To be a good astronaut, you have to be intelligent, and I'm intelligent. You also have to understand how machines work, and I'm good at understanding how machines work. You also have to be someone who would like being on their own in a tiny spacecraft thousands and thousands of miles from the surface of the Earth and not panic or get claustrophobia or homesick or insane. And I really like little spaces so long as there is no one else in them with me. to look out of a little window in the spacecraft and know that there was no one else near me for thousands and thousands Christopher! Of... What? Could you please just give it a bit of a break, mate? I get absolutely livid when my mother calls me and interrupts me. I always snap at her and say, what? But yeah, I, uh, they, but when I, they're in their zone. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but I need to remember, she's not trying to be a pain either the same way. <laughs> Parents are trying to 
who think the same way about us uh, goes uh, it goes hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, and that's partly mm -hmm. just families, right? It's yeah. Just, yeah. yeah, and pretty much just, he can tell you any way you want to get in the. Um, he's memorized every bus stop in Manhattan. Every, I mean, if you want to know there's a stop on the north side or which side or in the between oh the block, God. he wow. can tell you. Wow. And I call that superhuman power. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't think that's. I would like that. I don't power. think it's weird. I don't think it's a quirk. I think it's awesome. Yes. Yes. And I think it separates it's them from the neurotypical. Yes. For I think example, it's awesome. If you want to get oh. from here to, let's say, to Inwood, 207th Street, take the, well, the 20. God knows when it'll come. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the train, I strongly suggest take the A train because it's express. Just take that straight up. Really? Straight up. See, the, the way I've been able to cope with him and to help him is to try to always look through his eyes. You know what I mean? Even though I can't, mm. but I know my son better than anyone. And when I get frustrated with him, I must always remember how he sees things, and that helps me to have patience with him. So do you guys know when we're going to see Curious incident. Next, well, next week. Yep, a week from today. So, how do you think we're getting there? Two. So here's the theater. Okay. So we're going to take the northern line to Leicester Square. So we take the northern line via Charing Cross. Get off at Leicester Square, and then it's probably about a 10-minute walk from there. When you meet people with autism, I think one thing you're struck by is how individual they are, that they're thinking in a very fresh way and that they know what matters to them and they pursue their interests with enormous passion. And, you know, one possibility is that for a typical child, they're trying to align their beliefs and their thoughts with other people, that part of being a typical child is conformism. Someone with autism, that might not be important. They have their own curiosity about what intrigues them. They like to pursue it in enormous detail and depth, so-called obsessions. Uh, but it also means that they're spotting things that other people are missing. So they're asking very refreshing, very novel questions. It gives them, if you like, an originality in how they think and how they see the world. In some ways, people with autism are the ultimate um, anarchists. Yeah, no shot. Where is heaven? Sorry, Christopher. In our universe, whereabouts is it exactly? It isn't in our universe. It's a, another kind of place altogether. There isn't anything outside our universe, Reverend Peters. There isn't another kind of place altogether. <laughs> <laughs> one of the first lines in the play, one of the first things he says is, I do not tell lies. Actually, he does. <laughs> he really does. And, it, and he has the naughtiness of a 15-year-old. You know, he has the transgressive spirit of a 15-year-old. He's a little bit punk. Another thing he says is, I don't always do what I'm told. And I think in his quest for finding out the truth of what's happened to his family, the determination to not always do what he is told is tremendously attractive. And that is when I saw the envelope. It was an envelope addressed to me. I picked it up. It had never been opened. It said, Christopher Boone, 36 Randolph Street, Swindon, Wiltshire. And then I saw there were lots of envelopes and they were all addressed to me and this was interesting and confusing. And then I saw how the words Christopher and Swindon were written. I only know three people who do little circles instead of dots over the letter I. And one of them is Siobhan. And one of them was Mr. Loxley who used to teach at the school. And one of them was Mother. 
neither of you guys read the book. You have, Alex. Oh, really? Did you like it? Do you remember what the story was about? A 15-year-old boy who, who got tricked as his, if it, by his dad, whose mother was dead, but she wasn't. And then I looked at the front of the envelope and I saw there was a postmark and there was a date on the postmark, which meant the letter had been posted on the 16th of October, 2011, which was 18 months after mother had died. When I started writing my book, there was one mystery to solve. Now, there were two. Okay, so it's whenever you want. Okay. Come into the kitchen. So do you want to make the tea, yeah? Yeah. Do you want a sandwich? Please, if I would like a sandwich. When Kim was very young, uh, was he very different to other children? What made you think? Kim talked a lot. He talked a lot. And it wouldn't have occurred to me that he was autistic because he was really good with words. And he just seemed very bright until he went to school and then he didn't kind of fit in too well, did you? What was it like? Oh, school was a nightmare. It was really bad, was, was a very difficult experience for me in so many levels. He was quite, I wouldn't say normal, but I didn't really have any worries at home. It seemed to be at school that all the, these problems were coming out because at home, Kim was, Pretty okay, well, much a bit more relaxed. I remember being that. difficult at home. I do. Yeah, a little bit, but you know, when you, they're your first child, you don't know what to expect anyway. So, um, no, there was. I didn't think there was anything wrong with Kim. I actually thought he was particularly bright. So it was a little bit of a shock when we did get the diagnosis. Yeah. But I would like to say there is nothing wrong with having autism. It's just an alternative way of being, as I, as I like to say, you know. Just something different rather than something wrong would be a better way of putting it, I think. Yeah, yeah different, yeah, yeah, not different. Wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that autism isn't 100% genetic, so that means that there's room for environmental or non-genetic factors influencing why a person develops autism. And so that does mean that there might be scope for environmental interventions too. And the question about intervention is actually um, also a very ethical issue. Do we want to intervene to try to normalize the child's development or do we want to respect that this is an individual for neurological reasons who's wired very differently and we should let them be who they are, not trying to change their development uh, but respect that they are different. I was expecting Connor when Kian was diagnosed. I thought it was highly unlikely that I'd have two children with autism, but they're like chalk and cheese because Kian loves to talk. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. My <laughs> brother is nonverbal. Mm, so very, very different. Yeah. They do some things the same. Like, yeah. When you get upset, you both... Yeah, self-harming, unfortunately. Yeah. If, um, and bite if your hands. Oh, God, yeah. yeah Shows yeah. your... Yeah, diff, diff, diff is evident, you know. Connor's got one of them as well. They both do it. Like, yeah. Oh, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Why do you do it? Oh, I can't really explain why. It's not really that simple. It's, um, frustration. It's frustration and anger and hating being different to other people. Why I went away when I had the time to do it properly. 
now I have lots of time. When Christopher's mother is reading the letters, Christopher is playing with the trains. Christopher's using the trains to feel calm and relaxed and also centred, you know, because trains are logical because they go on a track, but what he's hearing from his mother is not logical because he thinks that she's dead. And so it's understandable why Christopher would turn to something that's so logical. I was not a very good mother, Christopher. Maybe if things had been different, maybe if you had been different, I might have been better at it, but that's just the way things turned out. Judy, Christopher's mother, before the play begins, has become completely overwhelmed with her circumstances. And I think it's mainly to do with the lack of any support or help and, um, you know, the socio-economic place that they live in. And so she's left struggling alone and becomes very overwhelmed. London, NW2. I know as a parent, even without children with those kind of challenges, there are definitely times when it's completely overwhelming. And, and so, you know, I, I don't judge her at all. I think, you know, she was in a, a life or death situation for herself. And after a while, we stopped talking to each other very much because we knew it would always end up in an argument. And I felt really lonely. It adds a dimension that he has this disability, but I don't think that that is really what the play is no, about. It just it heightens mm -hmm. the relationships yeah. and makes them the stakes much higher. Mm -hmm. But it ultimately is about a family. Yes. To you. Will you look after Toby for me? But you need somebody to look after Toby, Christopher. I'm going to London. So are you and your father moving house? No. So why are you going to London? I'm going to live with Mother. I thought you told me your mother was dead. I thought she was dead, but she was still alive and Father lied to me and... So are you going to London on your own? I think I am going to do that, yes. He's never been outside of his street on his own, ever. He's very in love with his train set. But it's what he imagines a train to be. It's not reality. So when he actually does go on his journey, everything he encounters is, is new and frightening and confusing. It's about all of us encountering things that we find overwhelming and confusing and feeling that fear, but driving through anyway. What are you doing at the railway station? Oh, I'm going to see Mother. Eight coaches. I want to go to London. Single or return? What does single or return mean? There is no coaching available on this service. Please follow the first 13 coaches. Please follow the first 13 coaches. Please For Christopher, getting the train to London was the biggest event in his life up to then, really, yeah. I think. Is this train going to London? Yeah, it's a huge odyssey. It takes a huge amount of bravery and, you know, bottle to him to get on that train and survive the train ride, hiding in the toilets and the, and the luggage racks. Yeah. Because there's lots of loud noises on the trains and, you know, the sound of the engine starting and the voices on the trains. Because I used to be very scared of a man's voice on the train when I was young. I think it sounded like a robot. It's an important part because, you know, he's going all the way from Swindon to London to meet his mother, even though he has a slight fear of going on trains. He's willing to do that because he loves his mother so much. Most other people are lazy. They never look at everything. They do what is called glancing, which is the same word for bumping off something and carrying on in almost the same direction. But if I'm standing looking out of the window of a train into the countryside, I notice everything like, one, there are 19 cows in the field, five of which are black and white and four of which are brown and white. Two, there is a village in the distance with 31 visible houses and a square tower, not a spire. Three, there are ridges in the field, which means in medieval times it was called a ridge and furrow field, and people from the village had a ridge each to do farming. We can now look at 
the structure and function of the brain in someone with autism compared to a typical person. And there are many differences that emerge. The brain in autism is developing faster than a typical brain. It's ending up larger than a typical brain. You can see more neurons or nerve cells uh, and more connections between those nerve cells. So one interesting view is that the nerves are kind of overconnected, which may lead to a sort of information overload. And that could be advantageous. It could be that that means that the autistic brain is picking up more detail so that when it's looking at a problem, trying to understand, for example, a mathematics problem, it can pick up more information, more variables to really try to understand that system. But it could also mean that as you're just going on your normal day, you're picking up too much information, every blade of grass, every leaf in the tree. You're not seeing necessarily the big picture. You're zooming in on tiny details and that that could interfere with being able to make an ordinary decision, like what to say in a conversation. I waited for nine more minutes, but no one else came past. And the train was really quiet, and I did not move again, so I realized the train had stopped. And I knew the last stop on the train was London. So I got off the train. Um, the show starts at 2.30, and we all know how to behave on the tube, stay close by to staff members, don't talk to strangers. So we're going to be taking the Northern Line to Leicester Square. You all know how to act in a theater. Um, there should be no talking, not even whispering, because it's really disruptive to other audience members. Um, no standing up, sitting properly on your seats. Yes, because the world is your oyster. Did you bring, did you bring me my snacks? Yeah. Now you decided to run? No. Train coming! Train start! Doors open! Train going! Amazing. How did that go? Well, that was amazing. Yeah. Was it? 
Really good. Amazing. And what I didn't like about it was his dad telling a lie about his mum. He was like, telling like she's dead, but she was not. But his dad said he had a heart attack. That was a lie and a fib. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say that to my son if I had one. What did you guys think of Christopher? I saw a lot of James. It did basically because James is brilliant at maths. And but I, I also he has saw a calculator with him everywhere he goes. Yeah. In his head. And well, also no, in his bag. And in my head. <laughs> I only use the one in my bag for backup. Now, the exam is going to last for 90 minutes, Christopher, okay? First thing you do, pop your name on the front. Okay, young man? Did you see similarities between yourself and him? Loads. Absolutely loads. As Tom said, it's basically me. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it's basically just me. Show that a triangle with sides that can be written in the form n squared plus one, n squared plus I, I'm good at maths myself, though. I, I, I think I'm quite good at maths. I'm okay at maths. You're tolerable. No, 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 you're good. You're, you're also very good. You are very Thank good, you, Tom. Thank you. It's just I don't really know because you're doing much easier stuff. Yeah, I'm doing the, um, so, foundation. So, from my perspective, I don't want to be rude or anything, but from my perspective, you, you're looking like you're really stupid. Yeah. But that's only because I'm so much, I'm the, so um, much, higher, much more advanced. The higher papers yeah. and stuff. You're doing basic algebra. Yeah. I'm doing advanced. simultaneous and quadratic equations. I wanted to ask you how the exam went. Tell him, Christopher. Please, Christopher. I don't know if I got all the questions right because I was very tired and I hadn't eaten and I couldn't think properly. Thank you. What for? Just... Thank you. I'm very proud of you, Christopher. Very proud. I'm sure you did really well. Right, Alex, come on in. Um, so, yeah, if you sit there, that's great. I'll come and sit next to you. I wanted to ask you, you've seen the play. I have seen the play. And I wondered whether you identified with any aspects of Christopher's experiences. For example, he, he loved maths. Yes. And that he was talented at maths. Can you say something a bit about, you know, your... It was, it was something of a sanctuary at me for school, actually. Right. And what is it about numbers for you? Um, well, it isn't numbers for me. I mean, yeah. I'm not good at mental arithmetic. I think for me, it's, the, it's algebraic structure and certain proofs can appear beautiful to me. Yeah. And, I, and I've, I've done supervisions at Cambridge and this came up one time. <laughs> and I was proving some, some theorem. Uh, I mean, a standard proof uh, for the student. And I was sort of getting enthusiastic. <laughs> and because it would look really beautiful to me. And the student said, I don't think I can appreciate it the way you do. <laughs> How are you getting on with your father? He brought me a book which is called Further Maths for A-Level. He told Mrs. Gascoigne I was going to take further maths next year. She said, OK. <laughs> I'm going to pass it and get an A-star, and then in two years' time I'll take A-Level physics and get an A-star, and then I'll go to university in another town, and it doesn't have to be in London because I don't like London, and I can have my own flat with a garden and a proper toilet, and I can take Sandy and my books and my computer, and then I'll get a first class honours degree, and then I will be a scientist. What's the experience been like? Have you enjoyed the PhD? Uh, 
Yes and no. Um, I think that there's been a lot of challenges along the way. I, I feel privileged to have been given that opportunity. Did you have any success? In well, I've never published any papers, so the right. answer, I guess, is no. Um, but but, but I, 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 have, I have submitted my thesis, so I yeah. got through it somehow. <laughs> Will you try and publish parts of your thesis? It, well, if, if, if I'm given the help and the encouragement, if, if I'm left to my own devices, nothing's going to happen. Because? Well, because I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't know the first thing about it. It would be like, well, like Christopher at, at Paddington or wherever he is. Just right. And, and even not that, because at least when he's at Paddington, he knows he has some objective. He, he, has, some, he has a battle to fight, whereas sure. for me, it would be, I just drift, I just drift away. Okay. But what about your, your life as a student in Cambridge? Um, well, socialising has been very challenging. I just feel out of place and I feel alienated. Mm. And I do sometimes think that there's, I mean, it will sound perhaps self-pitying to say this, but it's how I sometimes I feel that there's not really a place for me in this society. Yeah. So okay. it's, not, it's, it's not because I want to be like that. It's not because I want to live no. only in the immediate present. It's because I think I'm struggling as best I can. Mm. And that's where I find myself. Yeah. And again, maybe paradoxically, getting the diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. It may syndrome, help. It may, it may help because it puts you into a community. Yeah, very much so. And, I've already experienced and, a little bit of that. Yeah. yeah, and that although you've had your own unique history, mm. um, you know, uh, what, the, the feelings that you're describing of, of being something of an outsider mm. to society mm. is something that most people with Asperger's oh, yeah. describe. Yeah, and that actually meeting other people, you've got that same sense. Mm. You know, it might actually allow you to connect. It, well, it, it's already helped. I mean, good. I think it, it gives me hope. Yeah, I think good. it's the way to put it. Do you want to go to university? Yeah. What do you want to do? I'm, I'm hoping to go to Oxford. To probably to do Spanish, maths, and um, something I'm not entirely sure if it exists, but um. Well, I know, I think lots of things that don't really exist. Like editing or something. Something about uh, the, the, the decisions of yeah, English language. James is he, a real pedant. He can spot, like, a mistake in, like, a teacher's slideshow. If you go to Oxford, what would you want to do after that, do you think? Get a job, do probably. What? Want to be either a spy or an editor. I know, very, very different jobs. Very different. Exactly. The spectrum. One's the fallback, but I'm, I can't work out which one is going to be the fallback. What Hi, Martin. All right. <laughs> and and what what have you ever seen Gravity? What I have. Is it any good? Oh, it's excellent. I've heard it's Remember basically one of came for its visual it's effects amazing. and the performances and the special effects, the music. So go and see it. It's really good. Really. You've got quite high-achieving kids here, some of them like I James. Have. I mean, so kids who are taking exams, in it, I mean, do you think that they might go on to have careers of some kind? They might go to college? I think we can find a career for all of them. We just have to find the right career. And for some of them, it will be a less sociable career. That doesn't mean they won't contribute and give their 100%. I mean, particularly for our students, when they're motivated by something, they're really motivated by something. So they usually do an incredibly thorough job. <laughs> and I can have my own flat with a garden and a proper toilet, and I can take Sandy and my books and my computer, and then I'll get a first-class honours degree, and then I will be a scientist. I can do these things. I hope so. So now, what are your ambitions, <coughs> do you think? Would you want to be an actor? Do you want to, what sort of... Thing? I want to be a performer, I do. Would you like to live on your own, for instance? Of course. And my mum, you'd love me to live on my own. <laughs> but that's the trouble, you see. It's hard for people with yeah, learning we're... difficulties to live, mm. to live independent lives. And I find it hard to kind of understand about how to pay rent and basically problems with money. 
one also, you know, I, I need to seriously get better at cooking if I want to live on my own, seriously. You have a bit of trouble sort of focusing on tasks, Oh, yes, I do, because I do, because I've got all kinds of rubbish flowing through my mind. All the time. Oh, I want to talk about some really, some pretty dark stuff, but and it's not very... Sometimes you need to, you know, if you're going to cook, you need to focus on what yeah. you're doing. You really need Talking to about on. the kind of stuff that most people would not dream of talking to <clears> their <throat> mum. Yeah, and, you know, but it's all to do with being alienated, really, at the end of the day. How do you mean? Oh, um, just seeing other people with nice, normal lives, living independently and getting really angry because I'm not having that. Seeing other people have nice romantic relationships and me struggling to have one. Me basically not having one. That's one thing that makes me angry. Yeah. I can do these things. I can. Because so I went to London on my own. And I found my mother. I was brave. You were. And I wrote a book. I know. I read it. You turned it into a play. Yes. <laughs> Does that mean I can do anything, do you think? Does that mean I can do anything, Siobhan? Does that mean I can do anything, Siobhan? Does that mean I can do anything? Christopher is so brave. He's incredibly intelligent and really resourceful and highly instinctive. And he does all these extraordinary things and he gets to the bottom of the lies that have been spun around him for his own protection. And yet when he says at the end, I can do anything, can't I? Because I did this and wasn't that brilliant that I did this. Mm. You know that actually he can't do anything. And the, the piece has shown you quite clearly that he can get himself into quite serious scrapes just on one encounter with one person and it all goes horribly wrong. <laughs> Is this your first play on Broadway? Yeah, yeah. How's that feel? Broadway can be savage. The apocryphal stories of plays closing within 48 hours, and you just don't know. You just don't know. But I kind of love that element of risk. If I'm really honest, I think that's quite exciting. Good evening, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. hello. How's it been going? Good. Good. Really good. It's the last push. Get through this. Get through the gala. <laughs> yeah. And then life will be a bit more normal. Yeah. How are you guys? Fine. Welcome back. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Nice to see you. Nice yeah, to see yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that mean I can do anything, Siobhan? Does that mean I can do anything, Siobhan? Does that mean I can do anything? This play is about a young person who is different and who is misunderstood and I would just want to dedicate this to any young person out there who feels misunderstood or who feels different and answer that question at the end of the play for you. Does that mean I can do anything? Yes, it does.
I think one of the reasons why quite a lot of people empathise with Christopher is because they share one or more parts of his character, although in large part they're not like him at all. And I think that's because nearly all the individual aspects of his character, of his behaviour, his beliefs, his principles, I have shamelessly stolen from people I know or people I've met. He's not that different from everyone else. I always say that choose any other human being at random in the world and you will have 99% of your humanity in common with them. I think that Christopher potentially could have a really exciting life and certainly at the end when he shows how he worked out his math formula, he looks so happy that he's sharing what's so important to him. And it's nice from an audience perspective to think, well, maybe the neurotypical people, non-autistic people, are going to understand now why things are so important to people on the autistic spectrum. And rather than sort of mock people, which sometimes happens, and, and bully people, actually, they've got something to offer in the world. And I think that you know, at the end where Christopher says that he could do anything, I think that really, I think that sums it up really well because he could do anything and it's just about the people around him supporting him. Imagine next week profiles someone they describe as the most famous man you've never heard of, theatrical impresario Michael White, next Tuesday at 10.35 on BBC One. A little bit of progress, or a, it's funny that in the play when he puts his hand up, you know, we, yeah, we naturally do that with Isaac. Right. It's massive. I asked my parents whether they felt uh, that I didn't love them like other children did and whether they felt unloved or, you know, if they felt that having an autistic child was bad in some way. And they said that um, they felt that people, when they have kids, that maybe they have different um, expectations, but they just had an expectation that they'd have a live baby and that was all that was important, so whatever I did, didn't really matter. Toast. Orange juice. Right. Daddy. Yeah. I, I love you. I love you too. Nice. I love you. Do you know what? When we saw the chickens, a king was it a daddy or a mummy? When we saw the when we were on holiday. When we were on holiday, mummy. When when these. Two boys were not here. Um, well, when we were on holiday, yeah. there was a daddy chicken, and he's called a cockerel, oh, and he yeah. had all the red. Do you remember? He had all that red skin. Is he a grown-up chicken? He's a grown-up chicken. Which station is near the chicken's house? You, know. you definitely know. Maybe it's true, Ralph. Falmer. Yeah. Falmer, that's right. train to Connecticut, Milford, Connecticut, to visit the set where that's being built. They've been painting all the panels, so today I need to check the, some of the paint finish on the panels because last time I was there it was a little bit shiny. And then they're raising them up because they're going to start doing all the wiring into the back of them so that all the LEDs and the pixels and everything get put into all of that, so the whole kit can come into the theatre ready-wired and 
finished and that's the <laughs> that's the idea anyway. Do you like computers? Yes, I like computers. I have a computer in my room. And I like maps and uh, looking after Toby and I like outer space and being on my own. I bet you're very good at maths, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm going to take my A-level maths next month and I'm going to get... I was wondering if you'd like to make a play out of your book. I think a lot of people would be really interested in what would happen if people took your book and started acting bits and out of it. No, I don't like acting because it's pretending that something is real and it's not really real at all, so it's like a kind of lie. But people like stories, Christopher. Some people find things which are kind of true in things which are made up. You like your Sherlock Holmes stories, and you know Sherlock Holmes isn't a real person, don't you? I noticed a dog in the yard. Does he sleep out there at night? Yes, always. He's a very good watchdog. You didn't by any chance hear him barking during the night? No. No. I was given the collection of Sherlock Holmes books and collection of Sherlock Holmes short stories. The red one? And no, it, the there was there were two separate volumes of short stories. Uh, I thought the hmm. really huge one. That oh. I need a special bag. I, know, I, I need a special bag to carry it around. What do you like about Sherlock Holmes? He's a detective. He actually works very much up like how I work. I don't... I don't leap to conclusions if they don't have enough evidence. Because, like, if I saw my shoe, I wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't, I wouldn't automatically jump to the conclusion that it was mine. Mm. Because someone else could have lost exactly the same shoe. And also because loads of um like television versions of Sherlock seem very autistic. Do you think yeah. in the books that he seems a bit autistic? Yeah. Although they, like, annoyingly. The, they hadn't actually discovered autism by that point. So it's, impos it's impossible to actually tell if he would have been diagnosed as autistic. Is there any other point to which you want to draw my attention? Well, uh, to the uh, curious incident of the dog in the night time. No, it was perfectly quiet in the night? No, that was the curious incident. Oh. In the book, he describes himself as being a little bit like Sherlock Holmes, in that he can detach his mind at will, and his brain was a bit like a laboratory. So that was very much how we decided to design the show, like a laboratory of his brain. The first half of the show is like a kind of whodunit. So we also wanted to make the, the design a bit like a incident board in a crime room in a police station. Can I help you? Do you know who killed Wellington? Who the fuck is Wellington? Mrs. Shear's dog, someone... 451C Chapter Road, London, NW25NG. Take the truck to Will's End Junction, or Will's End Green. You've got to be near there somewhere. In a few minutes, we're going to be leaving. Um, the show starts at 2.30. And we all know how to behave on the tube. Stay close by to staff members. Don't talk to strangers. So we're going to be taking the Northern Line to Leicester Square. You all know how to act in a theater. Um, there should be no talking, not even whispering, because it's really disruptive to other audience members. Um, no standing up, sitting properly on your seats. Yes, because the world is your oyster. Did you bring my snacks? Yeah. Now you decided to run? Train coming! Train start! Doors open! Train going. Mm. Train coming. Train stopped. Doors open. Train going. Mm. Train coming. Train stopped. Doors open. Train coming. Train stopped. Doors open. Train going. Train open. Train going. Let's go. Okay. Okay. Looks like there's a prison right there. Beautiful. Oh, they're going now, okay? I'm confused. 
Alright, let's go this way. Is that good? Yep. Things kind of give me a headache. Okay. <laughs> Suppose this means Ed's here. Where's your father, Christopher? I think he's in Swindon. Oh, thank God for that. But how did you get here? Came on the train. Oh my God, Christopher. I didn't. I didn't think I'd ever. Come on, Christopher, let's get you inside and get you dried up. Well, that was amazing. Was it? Yeah, it was so really cool. good. Amazing. And what I didn't like about it was his dad telling a lie. I suppose this means Ed's here. Where's your father, Christopher? I think he's in Swindon. But how did you get here? Came on the train. Oh my God, Christopher. I didn't... I didn't think I'd ever... Come on, Christopher, let's get you inside and get you dried up. Well, that was amazing. Was it? Yeah, it was so really good. Amazing. Oh, amazing. And what I didn't like about it was his dad telling a lie about his mum. He was like, telling like she's dead, but she was not. But his dad said he had a heart attack. That was a lie and a fib. Yeah. Well, well, I wouldn't say that to my son if I had one. What did you guys think of Christopher? I saw a lot of James. It seemed like it. Why would you think that, Definitely. It, it, basically, because James is brilliant at maths. And, but I, I also he saw... He has a calculator with him everywhere he goes. Yeah. In his head. And well, also... No, in his bag. And in my head. <laughs> I only use the one in my bag for backup. Christopher, okay. First thing you do, pop your name on the front. Okay, young man. Did you see similarities between yourself and him? Loads. Absolutely loads. As Tom said, it's basically me. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it's basically just me. Show that a triangle with sides that can be written in the form n squared plus one, n squared plus I, I'm good at maths myself, though. I, I, I think I'm quite good at maths. I'm okay at maths. You're tolerable. No, 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 you're good. You're, you're also mm. very good. You are Thank very you, good, Tom. Tom. Thank you. It's just I don't really know because you, you're doing much easier stuff. Yeah, we'll be on so, for my, for my perspective, I don't want to be rude or anything, but from my perspective, you, you're looking like you're really stupid. Yeah. But that's only because I'm so much, I'm so, much, higher, so advanced. The higher papers yeah. and stuff. You're doing basic algebra. Yeah. I'm doing. Advanced. Simultaneous and quadratic equations. I wanted to ask you how the exam went. Tell him, Chris. Next stop is Victoria Park. Buses and trains are everything because you can control the stimulation of the sounds, the roads. He knows what stops. He loves light. Lamp posts is his current passion. Christopher, do you understand that I love you?
the thing that obviously that comes out so so strongly for, with you two, and I'm thinking the play is that the, the love is never in question, yeah. but it's how you deal with that. Mm. I mean, presumably you give love, mm. but you don't get you don't get it back. No, you don't. How mm. does it's, it's, yeah, it's not it's not love in the way that you've expected it, or you know whatever expectations you've got as a parent. Mm. It's certainly not what I expected. Mm. Um, but that tiny, tiny little thing will happen, a, 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 a little bit of progress or a, it's funny that in the play when he puts his hand up, you know, we, yeah, we naturally do that with Isaac. Right. It's massive. I asked my parents whether they felt uh, that I didn't love them like other children did and whether they felt unloved or, you know, if they felt that having an autistic child was bad in some way. And they said that um, they felt that people, when they have kids, that maybe they have different um, expectations, but they just had an expectation that they'd have a live baby and that was all that was important. So whatever I did didn't really matter. Toast. Orange juice. Right. Daddy. Yeah. I, I love you. I love you too. Nice, I love you. Do you know what? When we saw the chickens, a king, was it a daddy or a mummy? When we saw the When we were on holiday? When we were on holiday, mummy, when when these two boys were not here, mummy. Um well, when we were on holiday, yeah. there was a daddy chicken and he's called a cockerel. Oh. And he had all the reds. Do you remember? He had all that red skin. Is he a grown-up chicken? He's a grown-up chicken. Which station is near the chicken town? You know. Maybe you definitely know. Maybe it's true rather than Falmer. Yeah. Falmer, that's right. Yeah. And that was the genesis of Christopher. My name is Christopher John Francis Boo. I live at 36 Randolph Street, Swindon, Wiltshire. I know all the countries of the world and the capital cities and every prime number up to 7,507. So then we've got... We've got masses of these. So these are the Christopher's book. Oh, right. right. And we have masses of them because they get really trashed. So this is the beginning of the story. We're meant to be writing stories today. So why don't you write about what happened to Wellington last night? OK, I will. I can help you. Will you help me with the spelling and the grammar and the footnotes? So this is the book that Siobhan starts reading at the top of the show. I find people confusing. This is for two main reasons. The first main reason is that people do a lot of talking without using any words. What was central to me in the adaptation was the notion of making Siobhan his teacher, uh, the narrator of the piece. In the book, she's quite an ephemeral figure, or she's quite a marginal character in the book. She's the heart of the play. It struck me that I think everybody has a favourite teacher. English, no, we don't want to go to that one. We don't want to go there. We can go to maths and we can go to science. She reads Christopher's book with exactly the same perspective as we read it. She's uh, astonished by his imagination. She cares for him. She understands things that he doesn't understand himself. The whole play is based around her effectively falling in love with Christopher and falling in love with his ambition to solve the mystery of who killed Wellington, to solve the case of the curious incident of the dog in the night time. I've decided I'm going to try and find out who killed Wellington because a good day is a day for projects and for planning things. Who's Wellington? Wellington is a dog that used to belong to my neighbour, Mrs Shears, but he is dead now because somebody killed him by putting a garden fork through him. And I found him, then a policeman came and thought I'd killed him, but I hadn't. Then he tried to touch me, so I hit him, then I had to go to the police station. Gosh. 
I'm going to find out who really killed Wellington and make it a project. In school, we have 36 children. Our smallest class is three, and our largest class is six. Well, actually, we've had a new body, so it's seven, but we try and keep about six. Uh, so they're very small. As if it was running on its side, the way dogs run when they think they are chasing a cat in a dream. But the dog was not running or asleep. The dog was dead. What the fuck have you done to my dog? There was a garden fork sticking out of the dog. The dog was called Wellington. So I began with this picture of a dog with a fork through it. No real idea of where that came from, except that I have quite a black sense of humour. And I thought there's something absolutely hilarious about it. I mean, it's never funny, never funny on stage. But in my mind, I thought there was something really blackly funny about that. But to make it funny, you had to tell the story in a certain way. And that was the genesis of Christopher. My name is Christopher John Francis Boo. I live at 36 Randolph Street, Swindon, Wiltshire. I know all the countries of the world and the capital cities, and every prime number up to 7,507. So then we've got... We've got masses of these. So these are the... Christopher's book. Oh, right. right. And we have masses of them because they get really trash. So this is the beginning of the story. We're meant to be writing stories today. So why don't you write about what happened to Wellington last night? OK, I will. I can help you. Will you help me with the spelling and the grammar and the footnotes? So this is the book that Siobhan starts reading at the top of the show. I find people confusing. This is for two main reasons. The first main reason is that people do a lot of talking without using any words. What was central to me in the adaptation was the notion of making Siobhan his teacher, uh, the narrator of the piece. In the book, she's quite an ephemeral figure, or she's quite a marginal character in the book. She's the heart of the play. It struck me that I think everybody has a favourite teacher. English, no, we don't want to go to that one. We don't want to go there. And we can go to maths and we can go to science. She reads Christopher's book with exactly the same perspective as we read it. She's uh, astonished by his imagination. She cares for him. She understands things that he doesn't understand himself. The whole play is based around her effectively falling in love with Christopher and falling in love with his ambition to solve the mystery of who killed Wellington, to solve the case of the curious incident of the dog in the night time. I've decided I'm going to try and find out who killed Wellington because a good day is a day for projects and for planning things. Who's Wellington? circuitry for being able to anticipate another person's reactions, being able to read someone else's emotions, seems to not be functioning in the very intuitive or natural way. So the social world becomes a world of confusion and unpredictability, whereas the world of repetition, the world of objects, the world of numbers, becomes the much safer, more predictable world. spacecraft thousands and thousands of miles from the surface of the earth and not panic or get claustrophobia or homesick or insane and I really like little spaces so long as there is no one else in them with me. spacecraft and know that there was no one else near me for thousands and thousands Christopher! Of... What? Could you please just give it a bit of a break, baby? In the middle of my 
thing, I get absolutely livid when my mother calls me and interrupts me. I always snap at her and say, what? But yeah, I, uh, they, but when I, they're I, in their zone. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but I need to remember, she's not trying to be a pain either the same way. <laughs> Parents are trying to think the same way about us. Uh, goes, uh, it goes hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, and that's partly mm -hmm. just families, right? It's yeah. Just, yeah. yeah, and pretty much just... He can tell you any way you want to get in the, um, he's memorized every bus stop in Manhattan. Every, I mean, if you want to notice a stop on the north side or which side or in the between oh the block, we wow. can tell you. Wow. And I call that superhuman power. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that's. I would like that. I don't power. think it's yeah. weird. I don't think it's a quirk. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's and like I think strength. it separates it's them from the neurotypicals. Yes. Mm -hmm. I For think example, it's awesome. If you want to get oh. from here to, let's say, <laughs> to Inwood, 207th Street, take the, well, the 20. God knows when it'll come. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the train, I strongly... But when we first did the workshop in here, yeah. that was four years ago. This is in this room, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. This was yeah. being picked up I in the kind of one. Yeah. No, it looked much better when, um, when I saw it in the play. <laughs> and you were, you know, I, I, I kind of can understand why they, why they left the bath bit out. I nicked little things off you. You know this. I've told you this before. Yeah, but borrowed you... would be. I would rather put. Yeah. You what? Borrowed. For borrowed. Me, I would say. Borrowed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't steal. They're still yours. <laughs> but I borrowed little. Some of the little things which I thought that thing. This. Can you explain that to us? Flick this round. I can. Yes. Um, it's uh, basically. I'm in my own world. I'm playing a sort of a counting game in my head. I'm making somebody older or making them younger, or basically I'm counting from one extreme to another, like thinking of a word that's not offensive and thinking of the worst word, or vice versa, making it cleaner or dirtier, or, hmm. you know. Does it make you feel calmer? What's it called? It's called daydreaming, really. It is. It's something hmm. that I do when I'm daydreaming. In the play, I think, for me, it became something when I was very anxious and stressed. When I I'm could, anxious and I'd stressed, I usually you. make noises, I do. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Christopher makes noises, he yeah, groans. The and... noises were great. I could totally see myself in you when, um, when you were performing. We had read about it in books, we'd, we'd seen documentaries, but to meet yeah. someone who could really... Well, you're it hearing us. it from the horse's mouth. Exactly. And, and, you know, I'm using a, I'm using, using a metaphor there, <laughs> yeah, you know, I know. See, you know. <laughs> when I was young, if you had said this, if I had heard somebody say that about 20 or 15 years ago, I'd say, a horse's mouth? Horses don't talk. <laughs> what? Nay. What does that mean to people? <laughs> The second main reason I find people confusing is that people often talk using metaphors. The word metaphor means carrying something from one place to another. And it is when you describe something by using a word for something that it isn't. This means that the word metaphor is a metaphor. When we look at Christopher, we could say he's at the high-functioning end of the autism spectrum. And it is a very broad spectrum. Intellectually, he's very gifted, he's even precocious in some subjects like mathematics. Um, but if you analysed his communication, even then you'd realise that despite the presence of language, he still has communication difficulties. And one example of that... Because he couldn't communicate good. Mm. I mean, like, you know, when you, when you go on the street, like, we would see neighbours, and they'd say, well, like, how, how are you today? He would just stand there and look at them. Mm. You know, and he didn't... I could... I don't know, I've always been intuitive with my son. And I would tell him what to say. And just looking at him, I could tell he just did not know how to have a conversation. So I told his doctor, and the problem I had was he looked normal, so the doctor didn't think anything was wrong. His teachers didn't think anything was wrong. They thought, he'll grow out of it. Once he starts school, he'll be fine. No, that did not happen. I was not able to get a diagnosis until he was 11. Wow. What was his life like in school prior to that diagnosis? It was a nightmare. 
It like, was what, absolutely was he, like, accused of poor behavior. Or? Yes, uh, the teacher locked him out of the classroom. He was bullied, threatened. His life was threatened, and I fought. I had to fight the board of ed, and I fought and fought and fought. But and finally, I was able to get him in private school. You know, but it's still a struggle. Every day it's a struggle. You yeah. know, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's not. What can I say? It's my son, and I'm the best I can. <laughs> you know. I remember the 20th of July, 2008. I was nine years old. It was a Saturday. We were on holiday in Cornwall. We were on a beach in a place called Polpera. The routine of having that mother figure is broken. And Christopher lives in patterns, in a world of patterns, so he, he knows that he comes home at this time and he does this at this time. And once the mother figure has disappeared from his life, his, his routine is shattered. So if he can reconnect to that and form some sort of routine, waking up at this time and going to school and doing these things at this time, then life is perfect, life is fine, because it fits into nice compartmentalised boxes. Action Green. Sunday, you're going to wake up. You're going to do what next? We we brush your teeth. Get dressed. Have breakfast. What do you want for breakfast? Um, cream toast. For breakfast? And um, um, honey toast. Okay. When you are on the autistic spectrum, routines can be very important because if you have difficulties with social imagination, if you find it difficult to know what's going to happen next, then having a routine is really comforting because you don't have to worry about anything unexpected. Let's do three more, Mummy, and then we'll... Good like that, I don't think it's yeah. weird. I don't think it's a quirk. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it separates it's them from the neurotypicals. Yes. I For think example, it's awesome. If you want to get from here to, let's say, <laughs> to Inwood, 207th Street, take the, well, the 20. God knows when it'll come. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the train, I strongly suggest take the A train because it's express. Just take that straight up. Really? Straight up. See, the, the way I've been able to cope with him and to help him is to try to always look through his eyes. You know what I mean? Even though I can't, mm. but I know my son better than anyone. And when I get frustrated with him, I must always remember how he sees things, and that helps me to have patience with him. So do you guys know when we're going to see Curious Incident? It's what, next week? Yep, a week from today. So, how do you think we're getting there? Two. So here's the theater, okay? We're gonna take the Northern Line to Leicester Square. So we take the Northern Line via Charing Cross, get off at Leicester Square, and then it's probably about a 10 minute walk from there. When you meet people with autism, I think one thing you're struck by is how individual they are, that they're thinking in a very fresh way and that they know what matters to them and they pursue their interests with enormous passion. And, you know, one possibility is that for a typical child, they're trying to align their beliefs and their thoughts with other people, that part of being a typical child is conformism. Someone with autism, that might not be important. They have their own curiosity about what intrigues them. They like to pursue it in enormous detail and depth, so-called obsessions. Uh, but it also means that they're spotting things that other people are missing. So they're asking very refreshing, very novel questions. It gives them, if you like, an originality in how they think and how they see the world. In some ways, people with autism are the ultimate um, anarchists. Where is heaven? Sorry, 
Christopher, in our universe. Somebody that he's trusted all his life has suddenly become untrustworthy. Now, somebody who's not autistic would think, well, just because you killed a dog doesn't mean you're going to kill a human being. You killed a dog out of anger. But to a neurotypical person, a dog is probably less significant to another human being. But somebody on the autistic spectrum wouldn't make that interpretation. It would be just like, well, you killed a dog so you could kill a person. Ah, great. Mm. I found out I was on the spectrum when I was 12, and the reason I was told was because I started asking my mum questions about why I was different. In what way did you find yourself being different? Well, I got bullied, but also I liked computers, and I think that I struggled socially, and I never realised when I was at school that, and I think, you know, Christopher, if he was a, a real-life person, he'd probably learn this when he left school, that there are many people who like many different things that aren't necessarily mainstream, um, but I didn't know that when I was at school, and I just thought I was always going to be lonely. It was seven minutes after midnight. The dog was lying on the grass in the middle of the lawn in front of Mrs. Shear's house. Its eyes were closed. It looked as if it was running on its side, the way dogs run when they think they are chasing a cat in a dream. But the dog was not running or asleep. The dog was dead. What the fuck have you done to my dog? There was a garden fork sticking out of the dog. The dog was called Wellington. So I began with this picture of a dog with a fork through it. No real idea of where that came from, except that I have quite a black sense of humour. And I thought there's something absolutely hilarious about it. I mean, it's never funny, never funny on stage. But in my mind, I thought there was something really blackly funny about that. But to make it funny, you had to tell the story in a certain way. And that was the genesis of Christopher relationships to your typical 15 year old so he has um, a good relationship with his um, rat Toby but also he thinks about maths a lot and in some ways I just said he kind of has a relationship with maths it's what he finds comforting it's what he turns to um, when he's stressed I suppose a bit like a comforting blanket or you know perhaps you'd go to your parents more often 64 128 256 512 1024 we also see in Christopher that he loves patterns being able to recite prime numbers because the sequence never changes a prime number will always be a prime number and there must be something quite reassuring for people with autism, that they want to find their solid anchors in the world. And what seems to be the case is that a lot of that circuitry for making sense of the social world, the, the brain-based circuitry for being able to anticipate another person's reactions, being able to read someone else's emotions, seems to not be functioning in the very intuitive or natural way. So the social world becomes a world of confusion and unpredictability. Whereas the world of repetition, the world of objects, the world of numbers, becomes the much safer, more predictable world. I think I would make a very good astronaut. To be a good astronaut, you have to be intelligent, and I'm intelligent. You also have to understand how machines work. And I'm good at understanding how machines work. You also have to be someone who would like being on their own in a tiny spacecraft thousands and thousands of miles from the surface of the Earth and not panic or get claustrophobia 
or homesick or insane. And I really like little spaces, so long as there is no one else in them with me. And I would be able to look out of a little window in the spacecraft and know that there was no one else near me for thousands and thousands Christopher! Of... What? Could you please just give it a bit of a break, maybe? I get absolutely livid when my mother calls me And not panic, or get claustrophobia, or homesick, or insane. And I really like little spaces, so long as there is no one else in them with me. to look out of a little window in the spacecraft and know that there was no one else near me for thousands and thousands Christopher! What? Could you please just give it a bit of a break, baby? I get absolutely livid when my mother calls me and interrupts me. I always snap at her and say, what? But yeah, I, uh, they, but when I, they're I, in their zone. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but I need to remember, she's not trying to be a pain either the same way. <laughs> Parents are trying to think the same way about us. Uh, goes, uh, it goes hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, and that's partly just families, right? It's yeah. Just, yeah. And pretty much just, he can tell you any way you want to get in the, um, he's memorized every bus stop in Manhattan. Every, I mean, if you want to know there's a stop on the north side or which side or in the between oh the block, we wow. can tell you. Wow. And I call that superhuman power. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't think that's... I would like that I don't power. think it's yeah. weird. I don't think it's a quirk. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's like and I think strength. it separates them the brain, from the neurotypical. Yes. I For think example, it's awesome. If you want to get oh. from here to, let's say, <laughs> to Inwood, 207th Street, take the, well, the 20... God knows when it'll come. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the train, I strongly suggest take the A train because it's express. Just take that straight up. Really? Straight up. See, the, the way I've been able to cope with him and to help him is to try to always look through his eyes. You know what I mean? Even though I can't, mm. but I know my son better than anyone. And when I get frustrated with him, I must always remember how he sees things, and that helps me to have patience with him. So do you guys know when we're going to see Curious incident. I swap next week. Yep, a week from today. <laughs> Whereas 451C Chapter Road, London, NW25NG. Take the trail to Wednesday Junction or Wednesday Green. You got to be near there somewhere. And in a few minutes, we're going to be leaving. Um, the show starts at 2:30. And we all know how to behave on the tube, stay close by to staff members, don't talk to strangers. So we're gonna be taking the Northern Line to Leicester Square. You all know how to act in a theater. Um, there should be no talking, not even whispering, because it's really disruptive to other audience members. Um, no standing up, sitting properly on your seats. Yes, because the world is your oyster. Did you bring, did you bring my snacks? Yeah. Are you decided to run? No.
Train coming. Train start. Doors open. Train going. Train going. Train coming. Train stopped. Doors open. Train coming. Train stopped. Doors open. Train going. Bring it Let's go. Looks like there's a prison. It's beautiful. This way. They're going that way. I'm confused. Suppose this means Ed's here. Where's your father, Christopher? I think he's in Swindon. Oh, thank God for that. But how did you get here? Came on the train. Oh, my God, Christopher. I didn't... I didn't think I'd ever... Come on, Christopher, let's get you inside and get you dried up. Well, that was amazing. <laughs> Suppose this means Ed's here. Where's your father, Christopher? I think he's in Swindon. Oh, thank God for that. But how did you get here? Came on the train. Oh, my God, Christopher. I didn't... I didn't think I'd ever... Come on, Christopher, let's get you inside and get you dried up. Well, that was amazing. Yeah, it was really good. Amazing. And what I didn't like about it was his dad telling a lie about his mum. He was like, telling like she's dead, but she was not. But his dad said he had a heart attack. That was a lie and a fib. Yeah. Well, well, I wouldn't say that to my son if I had one. What did you guys think of Christopher? I saw a lot of James. It seemed like it. Why would you think that, Definitely. It, it, basically, because James is brilliant at maths. And, but I, I also he saw... He has a calculator with him everywhere he goes. Yeah. <laughs> in his head. And well, also... No, in his bag. And in my head. <laughs> I only use the one in my bag for backup. Christopher, okay. First thing you do, pop your name on the front. Okay, young man. Did you see similarities between yourself and him? Loads. Absolutely loads. As Tom said, it's basically me. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it's basically just me. Show that a triangle with sides that can be written in the form n squared plus one, n squared plus I, I'm good at maths myself, though. I, I, I think I'm quite good at maths. I'm okay at maths. You're tolerable. No, 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 you're good. You're, you're also very good. You are Thank very you, good, Tom. Thank you. 
It's just I don't really know because you're doing much easier stuff. Yeah, we'll be on so for my for my perspective, I don't want to be rude or anything, but from my perspective, you, you it's looking like you're really stupid. Yeah. But that's only because I'm so. And you'd realise that despite the presence of language, he still has communication difficulties. And one example of that is taking language very literally, so assuming that what people say is what they mean, whereas a typical child very early on understands that what people say isn't always true, that they might be joking, they might be using language in a figurative way, idioms or metaphor. Christopher is taking words as literal, and that's very common in people with Asperger's syndrome. They don't see the point of some kind of gap between what you say and what you mean. Mother died two years ago. I came home from school one day and no one answered the door. So I went and found the secret key that we keep under a flower pot outside the kitchen window. It's all a metaphor. I think that the death of Wellington, the dog, and the way that Christopher feels about that and then obsesses about it and decides to become a detective to work out who killed the dog, is all a metaphor for how he feels about the loss of his mum. July 2008. I was nine years old. It was a Saturday. We were on holiday in Cornwall, on the beach in a place called Polpero. The next Manhattan bound seven local train will arrive in approximately two minutes. I grew up in England from when I was like seven until I was uh, 18. Went to school there in Devon. But the rest of my life I've been traveling. First seven years of my life where I grew up in a caravan traveling around the United States and Canada and Europe with my family. Um, obviously not on my own, that would be impressive. <laughs> this is my first job. So how does it feel? <laughs> awesome. I'm sorry your mother's died. 